Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, good afternoon. Salaam alaikum. Come on, guys, you can do better than that. Salaam alaikum. You're not on Southwest Airlines. Feel free to speak Arabic all of this weekend. Nothing will happen to you, I promise. I want to thank Dali for that very kind introduction. Thank Ispu and, of course, Issa for hosting uh, this debate, this discussion, coming up with the idea of it, very important subject, which we'll get on to, and asking me to moderate it. Uh, as my wife, my kids, my mother, most of my colleagues, all of my childhood friends would agree, I like a good argument. And uh, we're going to have one today. A lot of argument, let's say, but a discussion, a spirited debate, uh, I hope with genuine and cordial disagreement on the subject of CBE, countering uh, violent extremism. CBE. I don't think we need to debate the fact that it's a horrible acronym. Uh, it's a kind of, it sounds like a medical illness. It's kind of thing you want your doctor telling you you have, this stuff and you have CBE. Uh, well, while we agree it's a horrible name, what about the concept, the practice uh, of what it's all about? Uh, it's a very, very serious subject. Serious issues at stake has the threat of extremism, violent extremism uh, being blown out of proportion, for example. Is CBE being used unfairly to pick on Muslim communities in the US? Or are Muslim Americans in denial? Uh, about the need to tackle extremism and to work with government and law enforcement in order to do so. Our debate today is CBE, engagement with law enforcement, harm or benefit? Arguing the harm side are Sahar Aziz and Dawood Wali. Arguing the benefit side are Karwan Bukhari and Mukhtar Khan. Uh, you could ask for a more qualified, more relevant panel uh, on this issue. Before we begin, let me tell you something about each of the debaters by way of a very brief introduction. Uh, Sahar Aziz is an associate professor at Texas a and University School of Law, non-resident fellow at Brookings Doha Center. Prior to joining Texas a and she served as a senior policy advisor for the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties in the US Department of Homeland Security and also litigated class action civil rights lawsuits in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dawood Wali is the executive director of the Michigan chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE Michigan, and is a member of the Michigan Muslim Community Council Imams Committee. Uh, Wali has been a political blogger for the Detroit News since 2014. Uh, Muqtada Khan, to my right, is one of Istanbul's experts, uh, associate professor in the Department of Political Science, International Relations, at the University of Delaware. He founded the Islamic Studies program at the University of Delaware and was the first uh, director. Uh, Kamran Bukhari is Senior Fellow and Director of Political Affairs at the Center for Global Policy, a fellow with the program on extremism at George Washington University's Center for Cyber and Homeland Security, and also teaches Middle East geopolitics to Canadian military intelligence and law enforcement officials. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for your panel. Today. really makes you feel like you haven't achieved anything in life when you read out these kind of bios. Um, and the format shuffle. And the format's very straightforward. Seven minutes each, rotated between each side, uh, two minutes of rebuttal each, for, followed by a short period of free-flowing discussion, moderated by yours truly, uh, followed by some questions from the audience at the end. The questions will be written questions, so during the rebuttals, start filling in the cards, I believe, that you have on what are cards? I can't remember what we agreed. Something? Yes? They'll be passing. Yeah, yeah we're passing around piece of paper cards. So fill in whatever questions, comments, criticisms you have. We'll try and get through as many as you can. At the end, um, look, as Dahlia said, this is not about uh, winning or losing. There's not going to be a vote at the end of this. This is not about uh, us telling you a right or wrong answer to the question. Uh, it's about uh, learning and acknowledging the importance of uh, critical thinking, finding ways to disagree or learning to agree to disagree as individuals and as communities, a skill uh, we are sorely lacking, especially on so many of the divisive and contentious issues of our time. Without any further ado, I'm going to ask Sahar Aziz to kick us off by making the case for the harm side of the debate. And I'm going to be ruthless on time. Seven minutes. The harms to Muslim communities arising from CBE far outweigh any benefits for, the, for three reasons. First, CBE securitizes government-community relations such that Muslims are perceived and engaged with primarily through a security lens. We are potential terrorists first and citizens second. Second, CBE diverts limited community resources and attention from real social, economic, and political needs 
that are much more pressing than an inflated terrorist threat. And third, CBE programs deputize us in law enforcement's counterterrorism programs that systemically violate our civil liberties. CBE is not about community resilience or community building, it is about countering terrorism, and it is merely a soft tool that supports the hard tool of prosecution. Law enforcement agencies, not social service agencies, are leading and funding CBE nationwide. Indeed, the leading agencies of the Federal Interagency Task Force on CBE rotates between the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice, whose missions are to investigate, prosecute, and convict. In 2015, DHS created the Community Partnerships Office, explicitly stating that it will focus the department's efforts in countering violent extremism, including community partnerships, and the office's name does not change the fact that CDE initiatives are based on a stereotypical, securitized perception of Muslims as inherently and collectively prone to terrorism. Meanwhile, the data does not corroborate the need for a nationwide CDE program. Only 41 Muslim Americans out of an estimated 6 million have been confirmed to have joined Daesh since 2011. The U.S. government estimates the total number of Americans who have traveled to Syria and Iraq is 250, compared to over 5,000 in Europe. According to Francis Taylor, Undersecretary of the Office of Intelligence and Analysis for DHS, in 2005 there was no specific credible imminent threat to the homeland from Daesh. Thus, when we participate in CDE, we contribute toward the bigoted narrative that Muslims in mass are a security problem, despite facts showing that right-wing groups are a much larger threat. A Duke University research study found that over 74% of 382 local and state agencies rated anti-government extremism as one of the top three threats in their jurisdiction. This is compared to 39% rating Al-Qaeda or white minded terrorists as a top threat. And when you compare fatalities from terrorism, which is 69 deaths since 9-11, with deaths from murder, which is 220,000, the hysteria surrounding the terrorism threat becomes more obviously about the religious and racial identities of the suspects than objective security concerns. Indeed, in 2015 alone, 134 Americans were killed in mass shootings, and yet we were not seeing CBE programs targeting NRA supporters. So when we participate in CBE, we of Muslims and then we legitimize stereotypes that we are all potential terrorists. A second harm caused by CDE is its diversion of limited community resources and attention from our real social, economic, and political needs that are much more pressing than an inflated terrorist threat. The most serious challenge facing Muslim communities is the alarming rise of Islamophobia and consequent civil rights violations. We are seeing poll after poll showing a rise in anti-Muslim bias that is transforming into tangible hate crimes, mass vandalization, employment discrimination, and bullying of our kids in schools. A recent study by The Economist found that 52% of Americans think Islam is more likely than other religions to encourage violence. An NBC poll found that 50% of those surveyed support Trump's proposed ban on Muslim immigration. These biases are contributing to a wave of private discrimination across the nation. Indeed, Muslims are 48% more likely than Americans of other faiths to say they personally have experienced racial or religious discrimination. Thus, our resources are better spent on building up our civil rights organizations, establishing political action committees, getting out the vote, and training young Muslims to become lawyers and journalists equipped to defend the community in the court of public opinion as well as the court of law. Our community also faces social and economic problems. 45% of Muslims earn a household income less than $30,000 a year. This is 9% higher than the figure for the general public, which is 36%. Some Muslims are affected more by poverty than others. For example, 82% of the estimated 80,000 Somalis living in Minnesota are near or below the poverty line. The Asian American Federation found that 54% of Bangladeshis living in Brooklyn are poor, and many Yemeni families are also struggling economically. Thus, if the government wants to build community resilience, it should give funds to social service agencies, not the DHS, not FBI, to support job training and employment opportunities. We are fortunate to be the most diverse faith group in the U.S. 65% of Muslims are foreign-born and 20% are African Americans. But among us, we have income disparities, and we have biases across racial and ethnic lines. These disparities have created tensions that translate into segregated spaces of worship and social, cultural, and political discourse. We also have domestic violence in our community, much of which goes unreported, that needs to be addressed. Furthermore, health professionals report that most of Americans face an array of psychological problems, including depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, stress, and poor self-esteem. 
much of which arises from a hostile environment that suspects Muslims as a security threat. These are the real problems that warrant our attention and resources, not CBD. The government is wasting our time and diverting our attention through CBD programs that seek to co-opt us into spying on each other and groveling to prove our innocence as we face hostility from all directions. We should set our community's priorities, not law enforcement. And finally, CBD harms our community because it deputizes us into law enforcement counterterrorism programs that systemically violate our community's civil liberties. News reports and freedom of information requests reveal that information gathered at community engagement meetings has been passed on to federal agents through fusion centers. A 2016 Duke University study of state and local police departments found that 90% coordinated with the state or local intelligence fusion center and 81% coordinated with the DOJ Joint Terrorism Task Force. Therefore, the system is structured for these enforcement agencies to meet with communities, gather intelligence, and share suspicious activity with fusion centers who then feed these reports into massive intelligence databases. And concerns with these databases are not abstract. They produce real harms to Muslims' lives. Muslims are harassed at airports or borders. Worse, they're, or worse, their lives are ruined when they are targeted in a sting operation or coerced into serving as informants against their community. News reports abound about FBI agents visiting innocent individuals at work and at home, asking for voluntary interviews with a lawyer without a lawyer present, only to prosecute them for false statements. Similarly, DHS places Muslims on watch lists that bar them from traveling or require secondary screening each time they travel by air. The secrecy laws surrounding these lists make it nearly impossible to remove one's name. Your time is up. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker making the case for benefit, not harm, is Carmen McCarthy. In the name of the Almighty, the most beneficent, the most merciful, Islamic, and everybody. Um, thank you to Islam, thank you to ISPU for organizing this debate. It's really important. Uh, before I begin, I want to state for the record that uh, what I'm going to say here is not in the capacity of Muslim activists, but as a professional who's dealing with extremism and trying to make sense of it and how we can combat it. So I think we need to start from CDE, a definition. We can get into all sorts of technicalities of what CD ought to be, should be, it is, it is not. I'm going to be very simple. Uh, for me, CDE are all those tools, social, political, security, economic, intellectual, that can be used to counter extremism. Having said that, yes, I am arguing for Muslim participation in our government's efforts to confront this menace, but not because it brings net gain for the Muslim community, but because it is the logical and morally uh, right thing to do. I want to lay out my perspective by drawing your attention to the way this debate has been framed, which I think is flawed. Uh, gain versus uh, harm, or benefit versus harm. Let's look at this dichotomy. It is a very communal view of, of this important issue, which is not just related to Muslims. It affects all Americans. It affects everybody around the world. So if we are only going to look at it from the point of view of what it does or sh uh, should not do, allegedly or otherwise, to our community, then we're only taking a partial view uh, of a very important subject. We're not just Muslims. We are American Muslims or North American Muslims, as some of us are Muslims, including myself. Uh, our countries face a serious threat. And the problem here is not just it's a simple threat. On one hand is our country, and on the other hand are those who try to speak in the name of our religion and are attacking our countries. Therefore, it's all the more imperative that we not sit on the sidelines, that we not shun CBD, and we not look at it necessarily as a hostile uh, maneuver from the government trying to uh, exploit the communities. But let's consider the communal argument here for a second. Even if we look at it from the point of view of Muslim communities, we have to realize that whether or not we participate, this is something the government will do, whether in the name of CDE, or as the United Nations wants to put it, along with the wider international community, PDE, preventing violent extremism, 
bottom line is there is extremism, and there are going to be efforts to counter it. The, and therefore, it's not in our national interest, and it's certainly not in our religious interest to sit on the sidelines and be critical of it. That we're actually debating this, whether it's beneficial or harmful for Muslims to engage with law enforcement agencies, is based on two false assumptions. Number one, that we, the Muslim communities, have a choice in this matter. There is no choice here, because there is an extremism out there, and there will be a counter-extremism, whether we like it or not. It is going to happen, and we have to decide what is our role going to be. Number two, that by boycotting or resisting CDE, somehow we're going to be able to make a difference. That assumes Muslim communities have influence. They don't. The only way to get the influence that this community needs is to engage with the government on something that affects Muslim communities, affects Islam, affects Muslims. There is, again, a reality of extremism out there that needs to be addressed by the government. Our communities can say, well, we don't want to participate. Ladies and gentlemen, this train is leaving, with or without us. We have to decide where we're going to be. There is no choice here. But for a moment, I'm willing to entertain maybe there is. Let's consider it. We assume for a moment that there is uh, and then the question is, can Muslims afford to make the choice of saying, well, I don't, I'm resisting CDD and I don't want to be part of it. I don't think so. We may be opposed to CDE as a concept, we may be opposed to what the government is doing in terms of spying, of the, the mistakes that law enforcement agencies are making, but we do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, I implore everyone, that we need to move out of this denial mode. Many of us are in denial mode, that extremism is a problem, but it isn't that big of a problem. And that is where we begin down the path that is not in the interest of this community. We can't complain about Islamophobia and not shoulder our responsibilities. You can't have one and then, you know, without the other. We are already in a very difficult situation where a significant chunk of people who share our faith are at war with this country. And those people then empower those voices who are Islamophobic. So what are we going to do? Are we going to shun CDE? We can do that, but what is it going to lead us to? Nothing. I want to point out that Another flaw in the way this debate has been framed is that it assumes that Muslims aren't participating in CBE. That's not true. There are Muslim organizations participating. I would say even those who loudly speak against CBE are also participating in it. How do we reconcile this? It's because the differences that exist are more a partisan positioning and competition over resources, financial resources. I say that those Muslim community leaders who engage in such politics must find the courage to actually lead the community and not be dragged by misguided fears and sentiments. The government is not out to get the Muslims. It has no interest in doing that. It does not have the time to do that. They need to provide leadership, and if, the, and, and if these leaders cannot provide leadership, then they make way for those who can. I, I will once again implore that we not set up our communities for failure. And on that note, you're out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Dalu continues to make the case for harm. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa ala alihi wa ala Our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam said, Adal ala sharri kamithlihi that the facilitator of bad is just like it or similar to it. So though I see things that are bad policies, doesn't mean that because the policy is good, that means that I have to continue to support it. And within that framework, we're starting off with this prophetic hadith, we see three problems. I'm gonna talk about three things very briefly regarding CDE, 
basically coming behind my colleague. The first thing is that CVE, in effect, de facto deputizes Muslim leaders, especially imams, to conduct a type of soft counterterrorism work which actually violates confidentiality and trust that imams and shiuk should have with their communities. This is something that's very important for myself as being an imam of two different uh, mosques in this United States of America and taking uh, and giving advice all the time, especially to people who are dealing with problems, the issue of professionalism and trust is at utmost for the for religious leaders. There are few, very few Americans, as uh, Sahara said, that actually gone abroad and embraced Daesh's message. This is also very true, right? But what also is very problematic in this framework that there has been this very small amount in that CBE uh, is, is a program that is addressing this, is that it is seeking to have religious leaders uh, cooperate with the government program acting as de facto government agents, but also are not held by the same legal parameters as an FBI agent. Thus, therefore, we've seen issues in which uh, uh, Daesh even uses this as a talking point, by the way. We used to see this where there's religious leaders that are involved in CVE actually plays into a framework that Daesh tries to propagate that all of your leaders are sellouts, they're in bed with governments that actually oppress the Muslims that do drone attacks, and then Daesh has used the term, quote unquote, coconut. You know what coconut is, right? It's brown on the outside and white on the inside. So basically, in effect, is somewhat playing into the framework of Daesh in and of itself that we have Muslim leaders who are working directly with a type of CBE program working as de facto agents of the federal government. Um, I myself have dealt with this issue one-on-one -on -one -on -one and personally. So it's not an issue of not discussing uh, or trying to talk to youth or troubled people. Of course, we all should do this through this obligation. But should we be doing this as a de facto agent of the federal government, which I said no. I have talked to many young Muslims in this community. And some of them specifically have come to me, I believe, because I'm still seeing as having some sort of street cred because I speak truth to power. They specifically, I have a specific shiyu that people will not go to because they believe that they have basically sold out the community and not speaking to the issues the underlying grievances of these young Muslims, which are primarily not theological in nature, but they are political grievances. They are rooted in politics. The other thing is, is that the issue of people getting CBE grants under the, the framework of DHS, also with the Federal Bureau of, In of Investigation, has somewhat a composed a conflict of interest. On the one hand, you have religious leaders who are to have a fiduciary responsibility to their organizations and to serve the community, but at the same time are getting funds and becoming part of the CBE industrial complex getting money. This is also a problem. So it's not just an issue of getting government funds, right? Getting government funds from the Department of Health and Human Services, I don't see this as any problem. So it's not about not getting any government funds, but under what type of framework, because you know, the I is an FBI for a reason. The FBI's primary job is investigation. It is intelligence gathering, and it is trying to bring forth prostitution, as we can name dozens and dozens of young Muslims who are on the fence, and instead of trying to de-escalate issues, FBI sit in their paid informants, confidential informants, acting as agent provocateurs, that instituted and presented plots that were not already ongoing. Give money, give plots, and they end up being the Adal al committee. They end up being the facilitators and provoking towards wrong. So this is also another problem. Lastly, CBE, which is, this is the most problematic to me, CBE is involved in, in trying to indirectly shape interpretations of Islam through quote unquote counter narratives. George Saleem, director of DHS Office for Community Partnership, testified before Congress in 2015, and I quote,
That is why the department focuses on cultivating and empowering partners, particularly those in civil society and the private sector, to develop and amplify content that resonates against ISIL. Excuse me. It's a long-held tradition in the American society. It's an American value, and it is also something in our laws that our government should not be involved in any type of interpretation or propagation of any type of religious <laughs> understanding. Our imams, our shiuk, Zaytuna, the Fifth Council, we are more than equipped to give our own interpretation against violent extremism, against terrorism, but we don't want anyone in the government trying to handpick a type of talk, which by the way, in the type of discourse, I'm sure they're not going to be talking about uh, illegal invasion of Iraq, illegal occupation, uh, that helped breed Daesh, killing over a half a million Iraqis, drone strikes that kill innocent Yemeni families, innocent Somali families. That's not going to be part of the, of the discourse for the football program that they're going to try to give to our Shiyu Akulu Kaliada and stuff for the left Thank you. Our first speaker to finish under time, mashallah. And uh, over to the final speaker for the benefit side, Mukhtar. Oh, I like to stand up for what I believe in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I agree 100% with Dawood. The government has no business to interpret Islam. But if Dawood does not do it, then it fights well. So Dawood should be a leading edge in our engagement with CBD. If Dawood stays at home, then Daniel Pice will do it. The government needs a counter-narrative. The government needs us to say that what ISIL is saying is not Islam. So Muslims all over the world, your children, your brothers and sisters, don't get on a plane to Istanbul and join ISIL, thinking it is Islam. So it's very important that Dawood, just look at him, he likes a new man of the He's charismatic. He can out recruit anyone that I still have there. But for that, we need him totally engaged. Engaging CDE is like voting for Hillary. You grab your nose, close your eyes, say, La Hala, La La Pula, and then vote. There is no net benefit. There is absolutely no net benefit to voting for Hillary Clinton. Take it from me. He, he returned Muslim money he knew from New York. Remember that? 50,000 bucks? Saying, I don't want to represent Muslims. But if you vote for the elite, <laughs> there is total loss. And CDE is just such a terrible choice. And there may be no benefit to us in not engaging and participating in the CDE program. But not participating in it can be devastating and catastrophic. Can you see the slide? Those of you from Hyderabad will know what this means. We have a saying. Can you see it? No? No? Oh, you can't. All oh, right, that's fine. Oh, so this slide says, this is the Hyderabad saying. It says, whether the knife fights on the tarboos or the tarboos falls on the knife, is the knife the death card, right? No, it's the tarboos. And the Muslim community is like that. Whether we engage with the government or we don't, we are in a dilemma. And that is our challenge. What we really need to do is to answer the question. Everybody is going to ask this question. Are American Muslims a partner against terrorism or not? And if you deny the TV program, if you do not engage, there will be many in this country who will tell you this. Let me tell you, CBE is not an important program. I will tell you the next slide will explain to you why it is relevant. But it is an occasion for us to discuss our relationship with America and our concept of citizenship. We are Muslims, alhamdulillah, we are Americans also. Thank God for that. And that's what the key is. Look at this. 19,250. This is Islamophobia. We live in an oppressive, Islamophobic environment at this moment. Can we afford to be seen as a community that is dissident? Is dissidency opposing your government, demonizing your government, a government that actually believes that you can help it? The government is not demonizing all Muslims, and they would 
He might even give you the target. They think that there are voice of us who can help us fight in battle, and that's why they need our help. The CDC, the preventive side of it, look at it, the budget for next year for the Department of Homeland Security is 40.6 billion. That is just the Homeland Security. The US is spending more than $300 billion in counterterrorism. It's going to spend only 17.6 million on CDE. That is 0.043. I come from India, math is in my genes. I hope many of you are too. 0.043. This is what we are having over sitting here. 0.043% of the government budget. So what? Is he really about Muslims alone? Yes. I think you made a mistake by giving this generic term. You should have straight away said, can we recruit Muslims to fight ISIS? Period. That is what they should have called and we would have a debate. CBE is about Muslims? Yes. Is it an awful policy? Yeah. Which government policy is not awful? Show me. <laughs> right? Does it profile and target Muslims? Yes. Didn't Muslims, aren't Muslims targeted before CBE? You think Muslims will not be targeted if you go to engage in this part? And what nonsense? Who is the keynote speaker tonight? Me? Or Sarah? No, it's Secretary Johnson for God's sake. <laughs> you think if he called it's not it's now is saying no? <laughs> no, he just learned from Brother Dalu that we should do this. No way! They will go begging again next year to get him again or somebody bigger. This is the chart that you need to know. People keep trying to minimize it. You don't understand. There are lots of problems in this country and there are lots of institutions which are addressing that, but Muslims do have the problems. Yes, mass killings happen all the time, but we are the champions of mass killing. Did you know that? The biggest mass killing in the history was done by Muslims. in the last year in the United States. That's what everybody will say. Go and ask this question. That's what the mainstream society is talking about. Omar Mati or Lando. Okay? People will keep talking about that. You never hear Muslims say that. As if it didn't happen. But the government, the media, mainstream America, Orlando, San Bernardino is right up there in their memory. It's very important to realize that we are dealing with a perception. That perception is this. You have to ask yourself what headlines you want in the papers tomorrow. American Muslims united in their refusal to work with American law enforcement to fight terrorism and radicalism. Islam 53 concludes that American Muslims will not cooperate with the American government to fight terrorism. You want that headline? Yes. Good. Live with it. The other headline is American Muslims, the real heroes behind the decline in ISIS and fight terrorism in America. That is your choice. Like it or not, 14 years ago I stood here and called Bin Laden. I told Bin Laden to go to hell and people didn't like it, chuck me off the board of Islam. That's fine. You did that. Seven years later, you used my own articles on your websites to condemn terrorism. You want to go back and listen to what Islam was saying in 2001? The same kind of argument, denial, subtle anti-Americanism, this demonization of the government. Get over it. We uh, have to. Get over it, your time is up. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to use the mic there, but I'm glad um, We're going to have uh, two minute rebuttals from each of our speakers. Do try and rebut uh, the arguments you've heard. I would encourage all four of you, while they do their two minute rebuttals, uh, if you want to start formulating your own questions, rebuttals, comments, criticisms, uh, Sahar, I'll hand it back to you. So, the government will not change its policies and practices because we participate in CBD. The government is going to engage in its counterterrorism programs, regardless whether we participate or not. What we have to decide is whether we are going to defend our civil rights and liberties or whether we're going to assist them in violating it. So for example, most of the changes that have occurred with regard to our rights, like the NYPD surveillance program, the LAPD mapping program, and series for special registrations just for Muslims, and Islamophobia, Islamophobic trainers who taught law enforcement to hate us and think Islam was violent, all of that changed, not because we were cooperating with the government. It changed because we sued the government. It changed because we engaged in media campaigns. It, it changed because we put pressure on the government through our own organizations who need our resources and attention. 
Another point to rebut is that there's an assumption that we can stop terrorism as if we're responsible for everybody's action. If I do something wrong, you're all responsible. If you do something wrong, you're all responsible. That's anti-American. So let's just start with that. But most of the recruiting happens online and in secret. Even the parents of the young don't even know. So even if you are going to make the misguided mistake of cooperating, you won't be able to do much because the local law enforcement knows way more about the terrorist threat than you do because they have many tools online to recruit, um, to, to try, find these individuals. Again, a waste and diversion of our resources. And finally, what we have learned from the past 15 years is that we should engage with the government, but it needs to be civilly and at arm's length, and it is a business relationship, not a social relationship. We owe them nothing. And what we will do is we will represent our communities, and we will make sure that our community's interests are served, and at the same time, we will adhere to the laws that bind us, just as they do any other citizen. Thank you. Come on, you Thank you. So the way I understand it, we have two options. We could either be reactive. Every time something happens, we go sue the government. Uh, we keep arms length, and we say, you know what? We hear no evil, see no evil, talk no evil. Uh, or we be proactive. And when we're saying that we need to work with the government on CBE, we're not saying that we should just accept it wholesale. That's not what we're saying. We're saying this, as long as we keep our distance, CBE will be built without us. They'll chuck CBE. Let's not get obsessed with labels here. Tomorrow we'll have another label. We went from counterterrorism to where are the moderates to de-radicalization. Now it's CBE. The, the UN Secretary General is saying, no, it's PBE. Tomorrow it's going to be, you know, ZZZ. Who cares? The point over here is that it's going to happen. The question is, what are we going to do about it? It's about us. Let's not pretend that it's not about us. And we can't be reactive. We have to be proactive. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Don't go to this. Last night, we here honor the great American Muslim, Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali, who we honored last night, was a direct target of the counterintelligence program of the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Muhammad Ali boldly spoke up when our government was doing something wrong, and he was a reviled man at, at, at that time, but later on he got the Presidential Medal of Freedom and was one of the most celebrated Americans at his funeral. So how public opinion is and how we are viewed by the American society right now, I don't think that tells you the litmus test of whether we engage a flawed program or not. Number two, related to COINTELPRO, which this really never stopped, right? The, uh, the psychology today, on July 19th of this year, there are two psych psychologists who wrote an article called The Dangers of Countering Violent Extremism. And in this, they compare CBE right now as basically COINTEL Pro 2.0, where the government focuses on certain communities that are marginalized, that don't have white privilege, then treat their First Amendment rights of freedom of expression, freedom of, 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 of uh, assembly as some sort of <laughs> potential predicate within mass surveillance community, sending informants that is really no different than the counterintelligence program of J. Edgar Hoover that targeted Malcolm X, that targeted Muhammad Ali, that targeted Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and a slew of other African American leaders, some of them who were Muslim. And last but certainly not least, is that a two-minute? Plan maybe. If you go to MPAC's website, they will tell you that from up to 2009, all the arrests that were made about Al-Qaeda in the United States, two out of five were from community informers. People from the community who identified people. After 2009, it is two out of four. And if you look at Charles Pullman's work about all the people who have been arrested in the last 10, 12 uh, years, one third have been from the community. So the community is already doing this. If tomorrow you find out, you're, like even Umar Mateen, he was already informed to the FBI. The FBI didn't do its job properly. So that is important. I think we are not saying 
that we need to drop everything else that you do and do just CVE. We are saying do everything that you continue to do and also do CVE because it's about optics and that's very important. You must understand this much that CVE is going to be run by people who are absolutely ignorant of Islam and Muslim community and if you don't cooperate, you put them all in a box and think the whole community is a problem. We need to engage them to educate them. We need to engage them to reform their practices. Cops and FBI agents, etc., who interact with the community are better informed about the community and they become our advocates when they realize that this community needs one of the best things this country has going for it. That is the problem that, that I want to say that yes, all, I agree with all the facts about the government, but this doesn't prevent Muslims from coming to America because there are so many other wonderful things that is going on. It is very important that American Muslims should be seen as those who oppose the kind of things I think of and just agree to have the government develop a counter narrative. We don't have to develop a counter narrative. Our lives, our lives is a counter narrative to what I think does. Let the world know what our lives are through engagement. Uh, thank you all to all of our four panelists for that uh, lively exchange of comments. We're going to get some questions from the audience. I think somebody's going to bring them up for me at some stage. Uh, but before we do that, we're only doing pre written questions, sadly, uh, to those of you raising your hands. Before that, I just want to uh, kick a few follow up questions on my own uh, to the panelists, if you don't mind, and you can all respond to each other. I'm going to start with you, Mukhtar, since you went last, and your last, the last thing you said just caught me out. You said that Muslims are already informing and pointing out who terrorists are in the community to law enforcement. How is that CVE? Isn't that just basic common sense and morality and patriotism? Why are you rolling that into CVE? You don't need CVE to call up the police and say some guy's going to blow up a building. That, that is a question for the government. You know, the, if you study Foucault, they will tell you there's such a thing as governmentality. Governmentality, good governance is giving technical terms to common sense. So yes, the CVE is just about outreach to American Muslims. In the past, the assumption was that the entire American Muslim community is suspect. The, the beauty of CDE or the improvement of CDE is that there is an acknowledgement, at least from the Obama administration, that this is a fantastic community and there are some threats and this community is the best way to fight that threat. If American Muslims partner us, we will not become like Europe where thousands are going to join ISIS. And that is why it is important. We may never get a president like this again for a long time. Remember that. You will not get a government which will assume that we are a good community and partner with us. They may start by assumption that we are a problem. So I don't briefly respond to that. If you want to change the government's treatment of Muslims, CBE is the most ineffective way to do it. You should go and engage with the media. You should train our youth to become journalists and to write op-eds. You should go and engage in interfaith, community events. You should go and change public opinion. If you look at the LGBT community, which was stigmatized much more than Muslim communities, the way in which they were brought into mainstream is through changing images of them in movies, in media, in sitcoms, and through litigation and other forms. The government reacts to political pressures and economic donations to their campaign. That's the most effective way of preserving our rights and our dignity as equal citizens. Okay. Um, so, so, Kamran, you said in your opening statement that it was ludicrous to assume that the government's out to get all Muslims, this idea that the government's trying to demonize and attack Muslims. Whereas Dawood, in your statements, both of your statements, you made it very clear that you think the government is demonizing Muslims, you make the comparisons. Uh, with uh, what happened to MLK, etc., etc. I just want you guys to kind of uh, address each other here and just see if there is, is there a complete disagreement or is there a common ground in terms of how the government views the Muslim community? I don't think that the government demonizes every individual of the six or seven million American Muslims. What I can say is that there are certain communities that have privilege and the Muslim community does not have that privilege, white privilege in, in particular, and that there are certain policies that, that target or focus on our community that are not really based on empirical data per se, but are based upon us not having 
that white privilege because I haven't seen a CBE program going to the white community of that church of Dylan Roof who went and killed those African Americans in South Carolina where there were more black churches burned down last year in St. Louis area alone than all the massages that were vandalized in 2013. Okay. Come, come and respond to that. Okay, so uh, the LGBT community, uh, the, the white supremacists, uh, are not engaged in uh, global geopolitics. They are not doing the kind, the level of devastation that uh, the, the Muslim extremists are doing. So we need to be clear up, uh, about that. When I said that the government is not interested in demonizing the Muslim community, the government is not interested in demonizing any particular community, period, because the government is a creature of bureaucracy. It has to do a job. Now, in the process of that job, it may cause harm to a certain community. Now, my question is, if you feel that your community is being wronged, what are you gonna do? Criticize the government and then say, I don't want to be a part of it, or are you gonna go and say, look, you're wrong, and here's why you're wrong? Uh, well, I'm just gonna put the mic. There's a question from the audience about the fact that, um, and by the way, just to be clear, the vast majority of the rest of the audience are for your side of the argument. <laughs> oh, that's surprise, surprise. Uh, the, I'm just making that clear now, just uh, no one has to go at me. Now, don't shoot the message. Um, the vast majority of cases, or a significant percentage of terrorism related cases, says this questioner, uh, involve preemptive prosecutions of people who haven't actually committed a crime yet but are slapped with charges of conspiracy, uh, involved in performance. Darwin talked about this as well. Um, how can CBE help a community when so many of these cases are manufactured, says the questioner? It has nothing to do with CBE. Those policies will exist whether we engage on CBE or not. The debate here is whether you want to participate in the way the U.S. government or not. The government will continue to do those things. Those are hardcore investigations and prosecutions of terrorism. What CBE is, is about dealing with soft, in latent anti-Americanism and radicalism. So that is what the CBE is supposed to do. It's about building a counter narrative. But look, 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 throughout this debate, you said repeatedly uh, that basically these things are going to happen with or without Muslims. I think Cameron talked yeah. about you get on the train, it's going without it. But surely at some stage, your side of the argument has to recognize that these questions illustrate, as, as you know, sure. like, that you're in a minority position. There is a distrust of this policy. Sure. So don't you have to, sorry to use a CBE phrase, win hearts and minds before you can actually say God of war. Well, the, the, I don't hear either of you doing that. No, no, the, the, the point that we are trying to make is very simple. We are trying to say that this is the best uh, overture we have had from the US government fighting terrorism. And we may not get another chance to get a seat at the table. The key question you want is, do you want to be inside sitting on the seat, or do you want to be outside waving a placard for the rest of your so life? Seat at the table, so why don't you want to seat at the table? I want to sit at the table, but it is a table that I will define what the agenda on that table will be. I will not let the government define the agenda and that's how I to come and attend and listen to them engage in activities that I think subordinate us, discriminate against us, and perpetuate the very causes of our uh, social problems. And while you've got the mic, before you come back in, I'll let you both on that. There's a question from the audience, which is a pretty good question for all four of you, I have to say. Can someone please explain the general framework of how CBD works? Yeah. They should ask this question on the way, I would say. To uh, somebody very innocently asked, what is it? How does it actually work? Um, and there's very limited on time. Can you, I would ask both sides to define as they want, in a sentence or two, please. Well, we're, we're, we're so deep in that, it's a sentence or two. <laughs> The government wants us to help it find the terrorists among us. And that includes spying on each other, reporting information, working with the government in stopping terrorism. And the priority is not our civil liberties. It is they're getting the most number of convictions so they can get promotions and awards. And, and very briefly, Sarah, very briefly, all the audience is listening, is there anything about it you like? Is there anything about like if you keep if you were totally in charge of everything? Oh, I would engage in counterterrorism because it's counterterrorism, and I would go to the table with lawyers at the table, sophisticated advocates who will do what a criminal defense attorney will do in an adversarial process and say, I'm happy to work with you. I'm going to report suspicious activity without counterterrorism or CBD, but we're going to do this in an honest way and not use CBD okay. as a ruse. Come on. Okay, so I agree that we need a seat at the table, but we're not going to get a seat at the table, Sarah by pushing back. 
We're not going to be uh, getting a seat at the table by appearing as hostile. Uh, we are already the target of uh, the Islamophobia community. They already say that you know we're not to be trusted. Now, if we have an opportunity in the form of CBD, you know, we may not like this term. Fine, don't like it. But what CBE is, at the end of the day, is a recognition by the government that in order to prevent terrorism, in order to do counterterrorism, CBE is a specific form of counterterrorism. Consider counterterrorism to be a broad enterprise, and CBE is okay. about dealing with the precursor to terrorism. Okay, and given, and given terrorists are not just Muslims, this audience member asks, why is there only a reference to Muslims and Islam in CBE? Why do we not see it related to Christian or Jewish or non-Muslim communities? Why is it subjective? There is no reference. There is no reference to Islam or Muslims in CBE. Please read it. Uh, let me make it one thing very clear. This is a preventive attempt of counterterrorism. There are lots of things the U.S. is doing, using drones, going to war, etc. It will continue to do that. What is also important that I want you to understand this is, is that right now. The government has called out for grants from Muslim, and so many Muslim organizations are already submitting the grant. So it's not as if there's a unified American Muslim position on this, okay? There might be some organizations who anyway do not have access to the government, who may be sitting back and being critical about it. Okay, so, okay we're going to move on. So, CVE appears to be colorblind with actual institutions. We know that we have colorblind laws, but how they are instituted in force have never been colorblind in America. We can look at mass incarceration to the shooting and killing of unarmed black people in the United States of America. So that's just not the case. When it relates to CVE, we have an issue of we're talking about a theoretical benefit. It's not proven that CVE will decrease Islamophobia. It's not proven that CVE will, de will decrease terrorism at all. But we have a proven harm, and that is a harm to our civil Okay, so on that note, proven harm versus proven good, you're making a case. Just to deal with Darwin's last point, metrics of success. Theoretical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. keep saying theoretical. Metrics of success. What is the tangible, you're saying it's really get on board. What is the tangible proof or evidence that CV is even working in its ostensible way? If CV was working, if we had the tangible evidence, we wouldn't be having this debate, right? There is no tangible evidence. This is a work in progress. I'm, I'm not advocating it. But can you point to a success story? Can I point to a success yeah. story? I, I, I'm saying that this is a work in progress. How can I point to a, a success story? I mean, this is. So it's not successful as of now? No, I'm not saying it's not successful. <laughs> but, okay, because that's what. So, okay, briefly fail story, if you can do it in two sentences. There's a case in Virginia, Ali something in Khan, I'm forgetting the name. His mother and his father reported him to the FBI trying to save him from what they thought was terrorist recruiting from Daesh. And they talked to the FBI at least four times and they worked with an imam to make an intervention. And you know where he ended up? In jail. And the mother was lamenting in the newspaper that she helped the FBI put her son in jail. And the only reason she worked with them is because she thought that they would help her rehabilitate him and save him. Okay, Two things. We have had three cases in Delaware in the last five years, and all of them have turned out positive for the Muslims who were involved in it. I can give the details, I can stand here all night discussing all the three cases. The second thing that I wanted to know is that in spite of the entire American Muslim community engaging and condemning terrorism, still a vast majority of people think that they have not condemned terrorism. So the, the uphill task is very difficult. So, so just assuming that Engaging or not engaging with CTE is going to solve our problem. Is not. We may have no net benefit, but the loss is catastrophic. Remember that. Not engaging is going to be catastrophic. Okay, let me ask. Let me ask David and Sahar this question. What, what would you say to a member of the audience who was sitting there who said, "Look, you guys, you're saying the right things. You sound like the idealists. But these guys, with all, they may have flaws in their arguments, but they're the realists. They're living in the real world. You're not living in the real world. What would you say in response to that?" I live in the real world because I see litigation and people in jail all the time. What I'm arguing is we engage with the government on our terms. We set our priorities based on our community needs and our resources. They want to give us grants, give it to the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Labor and help us with our real social problems. I would love to work with the government, but I will not perpetuate a framing that makes us lose forever. As long as we allow the government to frame us as terrorists and suspects always in front of the uh, communities, 
then we will never be able to and address this on and the on, stop it. And on that specific note, uh, Donald, you made a point that you think that one of the arguments against CV in your opening statement is that a lot of your fellow Iran's and Shu are being seen as uh, ISIS, Daesh, as pulling, pushing a narrative which says these people are Salafs, these people are stooges, and it's actually helping the ISIS argument by looking at your own government. But then you yourself, in your same speech, refer to them as deputized leaders, as de facto agents of the federal government. Aren't you pushing that rather divisive narrative as well? No, I'm not pushing that divisive narrative because I actually know of a case in my area in which a young man was busted with some weed, marijuana, and a 22 caliber handgun. And during this process, his father then went to the imam to go talk to, to talk to his son about this issue. The next thing you know, he ends up having Asian provocateurs, informants sent to him, and then it, there's this whole announcement about this the counterterrorism arrest, and he's in jail right now, not having bond. But in, in, in all actuality, the only charges that were against him were marijuana and also a firearm. And guess what? The imam that they sent him to is one of these imams that's involved in a but shared responsibilities committee. Okay, so just to be clear, yeah, oh, is that imam a salam in your view? Yeah. <laughs> I think that he violated a community trust in a manner in that regard. I think that imam should only contact the federal government it, just like the same standard for psychologists, for social workers, and as if they know of an imminent danger, an imminent threat, not when they find a young man who's trouble and maybe he's using some drugs or, or, or he's talking against uh, drones being used overseas. Okay, I'm gonna give, uh, I'm gonna give one last, we're out of time, but I want to have to make one last point of my choice. I'm gonna put that on this side to make one last point of his choice and then we're done. I would advise you to look at the UK's Prevent Program, which is the blueprint for the CBE in the US. It is an utter failure. It stigmatized communities, alienated them, and did not decrease terrorism. And instead, I would have you be more proactive in figuring out how we can strengthen our community through political advocacy, legal litigation, media advocacy, and building ourselves rather than constantly being on the defensive against governments who clearly treat us in a very racialized and suspect manner. The, the American Muslim community needs both of us. We need Saha outside screaming, this is nonsense, this is racism. And they need me going in there and saying, okay, I'm here to work, but first, let's redefine the way you frame this issue. Yes. Oh, inside, outside game. What a wonderfully Muslim compromise. We're both right, and we'll both play an important role in the future. Um, we are out of time. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm going to make three requests before we all get up and rush away. Number one is you fill in the feedback forms that should be on your chairs uh, that are going around the hall. Please do take a couple of minutes out. Number two, uh, a selfish request so I'm not lonely tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. If you can wake up early, I'm giving you a speech. No one will be there at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Feel free. I'll say things that both sides of the argument agree with, I promise, on the subject of Islamophobia. Uh, and the third thing is to thank this excellent panel uh, for taking questions, <laughs> for being so informative and good sport. Thank you all for coming. I'm sorry, I didn't get to the question about US funding of ISIS. That'll have to stay for another panel, sadly. <laughs> but thank you to Isfur, Isla, and thank you all for coming.